Singapore today is regarded as an offshore financial island nation and a gateway for international shipping. From time and time again, these two have been robust and have been indicated as the economic miracle of the island nation. However, little is known that there is more major industry that is contributing to the overall Singaporean economic model, manufacturing. The island nation today is known as one of the leading manufacturing hubs around the globe, an industry that most people outside of Singapore would probably find shocking. Many would probably wonder how a nation with no more than 733 kilometers of the land area can be a manufacturing giant, yet the proof of all has consistently been seen throughout the historical development of Singapore. According to the publicly available data from Singapore's Department of Statistics, the total manufacturing output in 2021 alone is estimated to be over 385 billion Singaporean dollars, a massive figure that helps employ over 350,000 people. The manufacturing industry of Singapore is not even engaged in low-value sectors. They range from the most advanced industries, from aerospace to biomedical sciences, to electronics and other high-tech products. Singapore is even known to be amongst the world's leaders in some of these industries. For instance, Singapore is known to be one of the world's leading chemical manufacturing sites, an industry that is primarily engaged in petroleum, petrochemical and other specialty chemical industries. Yet just like how they are a small nation, they too possess zero natural resources, meaning they do not even produce their own oil, but they still emerge to be a leader in chemical production. Moreover, chemical manufacturing is not the only leading industrial source that Singapore plays in. There is a long list of others out there. So how did Singapore become so industrialized, composed of major and global companies worldwide? Was it due to the presence of foreign investments? Or was it due to what Singapore has always been good at, public governance? Well, to understand what really happened, we must first go back to the birth of Singapore's early companies. Way back in the post-war period of Singapore, the country was left with little to no money. It was protected by the British and was under numerous tensions amid global and regional tensions. Vietnam was at war, Malaysia was in constant bickering with Singapore, and even Indonesia had some agendas towards Singapore. The regional tension, along with the looming potential global conflict would seem like any country in Southeast Asia, would never see a day of growth. In fact, if you went back in time and told anybody in Singapore, or around the island nation that it would one day house one of the world's richest people, and have a flourishing manufacturing hub, they would probably think you are crazy. But despite these difficulties, the country still succeeded in becoming industrialized, the first even amongst other Southeast Asian nations. By initiating the country's myriad of opportunities, the government sought to reshape the country by starting the largest manufacturing plant in the country, a place known as Jurong Industrial Estate, a 9,000-acre project that cost the government a whopping $45.7 million, which was established around the 1960s. Back then, of course, $45 million was a lot. If Singapore established something this big today, it would cost billions of dollars. But anyway, this Jurong Industrial Estate led to the foundation of many of Singapore's best-performing companies today. And while Singapore was busy cultivating its own homegrown companies, it had also set its sights out not only to reshape its domestic economy, but it went on to find international companies. It had introduced pioneer certificates for tax-free that would go from 5 to 10 years. The government itself would go on to set out numerous following policies and even go meet multinational CEOs. The first waves of foreign investments were from offshore companies mainly from the United States. These companies were known as Texas Instrument, National Semiconductor, and Hewlett Packard. What truly led them to offshore some of their works, however, was that they had wanted to cut down on home labor, and no other place in Asia except for Singapore had an industrialized plant along with cheap labor. It was also the perfect time for US-based companies to continuously seek growth every year for their business. And as Asia was undergoing turmoil, China was in chaos. Taiwan and Hong Kong were undergoing tremendous regional difficulties due to China, and Southeast Asia was also badly impacted, leaving Singapore as the outlier for all these. By the start of the 1970s, General Electric would initialize over six different electrical and electronic facilities across Singapore, and it took them only less than a decade for them to become the single largest employer of labor in the country. This embarked on Singapore's rise to becoming a large high-tech electronic industry destination. Their rise, however, did not mean they had zero challenges. Initially, there were many companies and countries globally that were reluctant to outsource to Singapore. The Dutch, the Japanese, and the British did not see any potential in the island nation. What is there to see in a small nation surrounded by major countries to begin with? 
However, the newfound success that these American companies saw paved the way for ever-increasing investments across the world. By 1997, 200 manufacturing American companies would have over $19 billion worth of investments at book value. Japan would also jump the boat and also play a huge role. Back in those days, the economy of Japan was flourishing, especially after the Plaza Accord. This led them to relocate their manufacturing capabilities to Singapore, along with other high-value investment destinations across Hong Kong, Taiwan, and Korea. While countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, and Thailand received some share, but were mainly for low-value works. One of the leading figures that led all of these was the establishment of the Economic Development Board, or EDB for short. EDB was responsible for setting up the Jurong Industrial Estate, and it too was responsible for overseas missions. The EDB today is regarded as amongst the best agencies in Singapore. It has over 18 international offices across 13 nations. Yet back then it was a small agency operating in a small nation. But anyway, back to the very beginning. Soon after EDB had set up Jurong Industrial Estate, amongst the largest domestic businesses that boomed was known as the National Iron and Steel Mills. They were initialized by the government's plan that aimed to broaden economic objectives and targets. They did not want to be limited to a small set of industries, but to be more diversified. This may be a good explanation of where Singapore is today, a small nation that does not rely on a single source of income, a feat that is arguably lacking in most nations today. The industrialization's success, however, did not stop there. Singapore would house its own service industry as well. It created Singapore Airlines to Neptune Orient Lines. What led to the success of each industry, however, is quite a complex answer. Did Singapore and its industries succeed because it had the right backing, or was it because of its people? Well, we could first pinpoint it to the latter. Singapore's people are amongst the most productive in the world. But just as how most of Singapore's story is, back then they were not as productive as they are today. But the very leaders, the CEOs and heads of the private companies, and these government agencies were known to have been trained outside of Asia. They were educated in Europe, America, and the United Kingdom. In essence, we think that Singapore has risen to where it is today because it was successful in appointing the right people in the right places and at the right time. Moreover, there were even challenges in Singapore's human capital. Foreign firms were reluctant to invest because Singapore's population was not trained for manufacturing. But what the government did was to even finance some of these foreign firms to open up their own training centers in Singapore, which led foreign investments to flourish afterward. That is also not to say that everything had gone well, and extremely well for Singapore. There also have been some difficulties and some failures along the way. One of the largest foreign investment failures in Singapore was a brand from Germany known as Raleigh. At first, they relocated to Singapore since they were failing against the competition back home. German wages were uncompetitive, but in Singapore it was perfect. Raleigh's executives negotiated an exclusive agreement with Singapore. They set out to create over 10,000 jobs, which would most likely become one of the leading economic drivers for the nation. However, this did not happen. In fact, the Rolay brand after its relocation to Singapore failed. The company declared bankruptcy in 1981. This failure led many to believe that outsourcing in Singapore was a bad investment destination, as the Rolay brand was also amongst the leading manufacturers of optical instruments back in those days. Their failure could have been attributed to Singapore, but it could also have been due to mismanagement. Since there was proof led by American companies' success, one should not then blame everything on Singapore. Today, it is obviously more normal than anywhere in Singapore. It is the world's best managed economy by far. How could such a nation located not even in a developed region but in a developing one, and was also the center of many regional troubles succeed? So many questions, yet here they are. Exporting billions in services and in products. To China, to Japan, to the US, and across Southeast Asia. Was the success because of Lee Kuan Yew? As foretold by many, or was it due to its strong sense of responsibility as a small nation? which also helped form many similar nations around the world? Well, the answer is truly difficult to imagine. Furthermore, Singapore's future is even one of the most anticipated across the world. You see, the government's recently laid out plan known as Singapore Economy 2030 is aiming for the entire export industry of Singapore to reach over a trillion Singaporean dollars, while also doubling their offshore trade to more than $2.7 trillion in the same period. With such an ambitious goal, one could easily see how huge Singapore would be in the future. And its success was probably due to the continuous proper governance that the country still holds. But do let us know what you think, since the answers of both international and local viewers are important to us and others as well. Thanks for watching.